Justin Peters, is it your intention to annoy the people who are watching this presentation? It is not my intention to step on toes. It's not my intention. So this, this to... isn't to get YouTube views or just to no. annoy people or be sensational. This is no. a genuine worry that you have, and I share this with you, right. that pastors and worship leaders should strongly reconsider playing Bethel, Jesus Culture, one and the same, and Hillsong music in their worship services. I just said that, and people did just click away from their viewing device. This subject is divisive, and so our plea with the people who might be watching this, hear it from two hearts who desire the church's good, not because we've got a bone to pick, or we, right. we, we're not as popular as they are. That's not the point. Right. This is about the safety of the sheep that are put in the protection of the shepherd. So with that preamble, give me your number one reason why you believe every pastor and worship leader should not play Jesus culture slash Bethel worship, hill song worship in their church. Yes, Todd, because this music comes from two false churches. Uh, neither Bethel nor Hillsong in Sydney, Australia meet the biblical definition of a true church. Uh, Brian Houston and Bill Johnson do not meet the biblical qualifications to be an elder okay, or now pastor. I'm going to let you make that case because okay. some people would challenge you on that. But I'm, okay. I'm, let me play advocate immediately. There have been a lot of good hymns written in the past by bad theologians, but we still sing them anyway. Why right. should this be any different? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, with those hymns to which you're referring, uh, most of those hymns were written one, 200, maybe even 300 years ago. And so there has been so much time that has elapsed between the individual that may have written a good piece of music but still had theological issues or maybe even personal issues. There's been so much time that has elapsed that when we sing their their music, when we sing their music, we're not automatically making the association with that individual that lived one, two, three hundred years ago. With Bethel and Hillsong, it's very, very different. That's very current. Uh, the, the, these churches, false churches, are constantly putting this music out, and they use their music as their primary tool of evangelism. Uh, please do not run past that statement camp there for just a moment. The music is being used by them for what goal? To enlarge their own camp, to enlarge their reach, to enlarge their churches, to bring people into their false theological system. Because here's what happens. Here's what happens, Todd. You know, uh, they're not going to write music that has just completely outlandish lyrics. Now, some of it that we, maybe we may talk about is borderline on, on that. But a lot of their music, it's gonna pass a basic doctrinal smell test. And that's intentional because they know if it doesn't that most churches aren't gonna put it in their services. And here's what happens. On Sunday morning, when churches put these lyrics up on the screen and the unsuspecting person sitting out there in the pew, reading the lyrics, singing the lyrics, and then they see in the fine print at the bottom, copyright, like, copyright, Bethel music, copyright Hillsong, and let's throw in elevation music with that as well, Stephen Furtick. So when they when they see the fine print, they think, oh, Bethel, oh, Hillsong. I, I think I'll check them out. They must be okay. We're singing their music, and so they use their music as a hook to pull unsuspecting people into their false theological system. And so it, the local church singing those songs give the local church's stamp of approval. The pastor is saying, it's okay congregation, these songs are fine and you can follow the people who produce them. Or they hear them on the radio, then they see them that we're singing them in church and they go, they're fine. Right. Now, right now, Justin, people are going, Come on, you're telling me that we sing a song by Bethel or Elevation or Hillsong, it's orthodox. You're telling me that people are gonna see the fine print and then they're gonna run off and start following their teaching? That's ridiculous and you can't prove that. Oh, I think common sense proves it. I mean, that's why they do what they do. That's why they put their music out there. That, 
this, as I said, this is their primary tool no, the, of growing it, it, their it, church. It's not speculative. The numbers no, it's not speculative. This the is the fastest growing movement in the world. As bad as it is here, as bad as the Word of Faith movement and the prosperity gospel is here, I can tell you, Todd, because I've been all over the world, it is far worse in other parts of the world, far worse in Central and South America and Africa. Africa is absolutely saturated. And so we do have proof that this is what is happening because of the explosive growth. And the number, as we watch our kids disappearing from good churches, they are regularly going into movements like this because of the ecstatic worship, the emotionalism, because they believe the music is okay, because evangelicals as a whole have put a stamp of approval on Bethel and Hillsong music, therefore putting a stamp of approval on the churches. Right. All right. One of, one of the pastor's most solemn duties is to guard his flock against wolves. He must do that. And if he's not doing that, then he's, he's failing in one of his right, primary so now responsibilities. You've, you've just made a very strong statement. You're saying that these churches are wolves. Make your case. Bethel comes, it is word of faith, new apostolic reformation. Uh, this movement, this health and wealth, prosperity gospel, word of faith movement, it is rooted in the metaphysical cults like Christian science, new age, Gnosticism. And it has a very aberrant view of God, a very aberrant view of man, a very aberrant Christology. They teach that um, they teach the little gods doctrine that we are all little gods, which has a whole lot more in common with Mormonism than it does anything else. They teach the little gods doctrine. They teach positive confession that we can speak things into existence. That is an ability that only God has, but they ascribe that ability to humans, to Christians. Uh, they have a very aberrant view of Christ, his person and his work. They believe that Jesus was that Jesus completely divested himself of his deity when he was on earth, completely divested himself of his deity. In fact, Bill Johnson, one of his quotes, one of his many, he said, Jesus was the most normal Christian who ever lived. And so uh, if you are a Christian, then you are just like Jesus, all the rights, all the privileges. They believe that Jesus atoned for our sins down in hell where he literally had to be reborn. He died a spiritual death, ceased to be God, and had to be reborn. Jesus actually had to get saved. He had to be, in fact, Bill Johnson says that Jesus was the first uh, born again man, that he, that he was born again. Uh, Jesus had to get saved. This is a standard doctrine that Kenneth Copeland has taught for decades and Kenneth Hagin before him. So. And their, and their whole gospel message is different. It, the, the prosperity gospel, they appeal to people through two of the most basic and universal of all human desires, the desire to be wealthy and the desire to be physically healed. Almost everyone on the planet wants that. They'll say, if, you, if you'll come to Jesus, if you'll just ask Jesus into your heart, then he'll make you rich and you'll never have to be sick again. Well, you've got about seven billion people on the planet who want those things. And so they make this emotive response to, these, to this prosperity gospel, but that is not the real gospel. They, they rarely talk about sin. If you, if you listen to Bill Johnson or Brian Houston or Joel Osteen, Kenneth Copeland, Joel Osteen, any, any of these, Benny Hinn, sin is not something that you commit against a thrice holy God that incurs his wrath. In fact, uh, Bethel Church actually will flat out teach you that man is inherently good. That man is inherently good. That's one of their staple teachings. So sin is not something that you commit against a thrice holy God that incurs his wrath. Rather, sin is something that prevents you from having your best life now. It prevents you from experiencing the abundant life. It's just something that hinders you. It's not something that incurs the wrath of God. So, so these are false churches. And you and I have both met parents, weeping parents, whose sons and daughters, because of the music, have gone into these systems. They then go into their supernatural school of healing ministries. 
They have dead raising teams. If you haven't heard about Olivia, the little girl who died, one of the worship leaders, or Olive, rather, who died. And for seven, eight days, they tried to call on God and insist resurrection because we have the authority to resurrect the dead. That made, that made national news. That's the tip of the iceberg. They have dead raising teams which will go out into the streets and tell people that they can pray for their dead relatives. This is grave soaking yes. territory that we're talking yes. about. Yes. Describe what that is. They right. believe that when a one of their generals, one of their like whether it's Amy Simple McPherson or Catherine Kuhlman or Smith Wigglesworth, one of these charismatic generals, quote unquote, from days gone by, when they die, there's an anointing that resides on their bones and and hence the, the the grave and if you go and lay on the tomb or lay on the grave you can actually soak up this anointing from these dead people that is that is straight out of the occult the occult that is that is demonic and and that is that is a normal practice for bethel and also the association with what teachers and this is both bethel and hillsong because Justin, you're right. Hillsong, I don't think, is as extreme outwardly as Bethel is. Not in the, right. Not because in Bethel their is the outward fire tunnels, practices. the falling down, and the right. shaking, and the flopping. Yeah, it's 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 a, a, not quite as ecstatic as that. But does Bill Johnson ever preach at Brian Houston's church, and vice versa? Yes. Do any other false teachers preach in their pulpits? Yes. Hillsong has been the host to practically every well-known false teacher that uh, soils the landscape of evangel evangelicalism today. Uh, they endorse everyone. Bill Johnson has spoken there numerous times recently. Uh, Bill Johnson, you name it, uh, they endorse Kenneth Copeland, they endorse Joel Osteen, they endorse Benny Hinn, uh, all Hillsong. of them. Hillsong does, yes, okay. absolutely some of their music passes muster. Is there any music that is being produced by Hillsong or Bethel that is not passing muster? Yes. You, you got any examples for us? I might. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. All right, what have you got? This is a, from a, a, one of their songs entitled Closer. Your love has, has ravished my heart. Keep going. I've got it too. You got the same thing? Uh-huh. Your love has ravished my heart and taking me over, taking me over. All I want is to be with you forever, with you forever. Pull me you, you a little do, you closer. You do the rest because it gets too creepy for okay. me. It, it, it is. It I is mean, creepy. It, it, yeah. We're talking about Jesus. Yeah, we're talking about, this is supposed to be about Jesus. Pull me a little closer, take me a little deeper. I want to know your heart, I want to know your heart because your love is so much sweeter than anything I've tasted Whoa, whoa, how great your love is for me. Whoa, whoa, how great your love is for me. Uh, here's, here's one, Todd, from a song entitled, We Dance. We Dance. You steady me, slow and sweet, we sway. Take the lead and I will follow. Finally ready now to close my eyes and just believe that you won't lead me where you, won't, where you don't go. Uh, when my faith gets tired and my hope seems lost, you spin me round and round and remind me of that song, the one you wrote, wrote for me, and we dance and we dance. Uh, you still my heart again, I breathe you in like I've never breathed till now, we dance, we dance. This is what you do. It's always like springtime with you, making all things new. Your light is breaking through the dark. Your love is sweeter than wine, bringing joy, bringing life. This is what you do. This is what you do. You make me come alive. It's like I'm living for the first time, finally for the first time. So, the, you know, the old jokes about replace Jesus with your boyfriend. It's not a joke. We could go on and on, but there's a romantic emphasis with many of these lyrics that, let's just be honest, it borders on downright creepy. However, Justin, there's another component to this movement that we're concerned about, that people are being swept in via the music. Talk about the money aspect of Bethel and Hillsong. I couldn't even put a dollar sign on it. Multiple, multiple tens of millions of dollars. Per year. Per year. Where else does the cash come from? Every time a church sings one of these songs, if, if they're being on the up and up, they're supposed to pay a royalty to the 
to the company or the person of the group that wrote the song. Christian Copyright Licensing International. Please know when you sing these songs in your churches, there is money that goes into these false churches every single time you sing it. Now, if I may illustrate absurdity by being absurd a little bit, let's just say Planned Parenthood decides to write some Christian music that would pass a doctrinal smell test. Would you sing it in your church? Knowing that some money every time you sing that song is going to support an organization that murders babies, would you sing that song in your church? I would submit to you that singing Bethel and Hillsong when you're sending money to those false churches, that's far worse. And every pastor who heard that potentially went, you are out of your mind. You just compared Planned Parenthood to a church. You want to defend that? Bethel and Hillsong are false churches. These aren't real churches. So what I'm saying is, is even the good churches, and I'll be honest about it, I've been in some good churches and I've looked up and they're singing a Hillsong song and it just makes me wince and I won't sing it. Talk to the pastor afterwards. But when they sing that song, they're sending money to false churches that are opposed to Christ, opposed to the gospel, teaching a false gospel, leading people to hell. I take a back seat to no one in my pro-life stance. I'll take a back seat to no one in that. But if there's anything worse than murdering babies, it is sending people down the primrose path to hell. That's worse. Blaspheming God, that's worse. And so know that when you sing those songs, your money's going to support false churches that are opposed to Jesus Christ. Are these movements prosperity movements? Yes, they are, Todd. They are. Now, a lot of people don't necessarily associate prosperity gospel with Bethel or Hillsong. Uh, well, Brian Houston, the pastor at Hillsong, has written a book entitled, quote, you can't make this stuff, You Need More Money. <laughs> that literally, that the, was the name of one of well, his and books. I wouldn't disagree with that. <laughs> but that's not the point. That's not, yeah, yeah right. that's not the point. Yes, Hillsong does teach this, this health and wealth prosperity gospel. Bethel does as well, and a lot of people don't realize this, but just in the last few weeks, I've watched some of their services live streaming. I'm gonna to read to you, Todd. This is their, their declaration. They, they read this right before the offering is taken. He began by saying, nothing happens in the kingdom until we first declare something. This is the positive confession doctrine. You speak things into existence. Word faith. And not to chase the rabbit here, but the little girl, Olive, who died. When you watch videos of that, they weren't asking God to raise her. They were commanding Olive to come up out of the grave. This is, this is bad juju. This is, but anyway, they say this, quote, As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessing and increase. They had the whole church, they, they, the whole church recites this right before they take the offering. Objection. You're just being too critical. We're just singing songs. Lighten up. Psalm 138, verse 2. God holds his name and his word above all things. Worship is very, very serious business. It is not something to take lightly. It's not something to trifle with. Uh, God holds his name and his word above all things. He must be worshiped in spirit and in truth, John chapter four. And dear friends, when we worship, and that term is, everybody thinks of music when we think of worship, preaching is worship. But when we, when we worship, when we do the music, musical aspect of worship, we have an audience of one. We have got one person that we've got to please, and that is God. And he takes worship very seriously. He is thrice holy. And I can assure you, God is not honored by quote-unquote worship that comes out of false churches 
that blaspheme his name every single time they gather. He is not honored by music that comes out of false churches that exploit the poor, the sick, the desperate, the widows who preach a false Jesus, a false atonement, and a false gospel. God is not honored when we sing music that comes out of that. All right. Justin, in closing, please speak to a pastor, to the worship leader who has a similar responsibility to protect the flock. Please do your best to encourage them to consider the responsibility and the accountability to the Lord that they have to be guarding the sheep from wolves. Yes. And I understand that a lot of pastors probably don't understand all the ins and outs of Bethel and Hillsong. But as a pastor, brother, one of your most solemn duties is to protect your flock from the wolves. There are wolves, and how do wolves dress? In sheep's clothing. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. We must teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. We've got to protect the sheep from the wolves that are prowling about and want to devour them. And Bethel and Hillsong, these are false churches and they are dens of wolves and they are out there trying to prey upon your sheep. So guard your sheep, love them enough to guard them. And uh, the, the most loving thing we can do for someone is to tell them the truth. Uh, that is the most loving thing to do. The, the most hateful thing we could do to someone is to know the truth, but not tell them. If you really want to hate somebody, do that. If you want to show love, love them enough to tell them the truth. Love them enough to protect them from those wolves that would, have, that would devour them.